The doctors classified me with hand heart syndrome. Are you ready to challenge the impossible? Nick Santos Nick Santos Welcome back to Max Out with Ed Milet. This man to my left, I think, is one of the most inspiring people on planet Earth today. Welcome to Beijing. At the time of my birth, I was the 12th baby in medical history that they've ever seen this happen to. And out of the 12, eight of them have passed away due to undeveloped organs. Like any other 12-year-old, Nick Santanastasso enjoys football, skateboarding, and playing video games. And while these may sound like simple everyday activities, for Nick, they are anything but. He is one boy who defies the odds. It's not about how many times we fall down. It's about how many times we get up and keep moving forward. And an unbelievable public speaker, for the record, that you're going to hear about in a minute. But this is Nick Santanastasso. Have you ever felt... Like you were invisible. Have you ever felt like you weren't good enough? Raise your hand if at least one time in your life you said, why me? Look around the room. It's everywhere. We all get a taste of that victim mentality. But why me? Why do I have to be born like this? Why do I have to be born with no legs and one arm? Why do the kids have to make fun of me? Why do I have to go through these challenges? What I've realized over the 23 years of my life, it's not the physical body that holds us back, but it's the mindset. The biggest disability you can have is a bad mindset. Welcome back to the Give Back Podcast, where we bring you the greatest comeback stories by the biggest names. I'm Greg Kelly with my co-host, Zeke Pike. And today we're joined by one of the most remarkable, inspirational human beings that I've had the pleasure to meet. Considered a medical miracle from viral internet sensation to bodybuilder, an author, entrepreneur, and a philanthropist. One of the top transformational speakers of this generation. A true get back story. My guy, Nick Santana Stasso. You crushed it. Nailed it, baby. <laughs> Let's up. go. Thanks Welcome for having me. Welcome to the Get Back, man. I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here, really. Uh, me and Greg have been, been talking about you specifically being here and just how inspired we are by you and your story and your journey to, to where you're at now in life. And, man, we're just eager to hear about it. I'm fired up. That was a great intro. I need to get that one and use it more. <laughs> but, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, take us, I'll take us back and... And as I go through this story, any rabbit holes that we want to jump in, let's go in some rabbit holes and I'll leave it all, all out on, on the podcast here. Love that. All right. Um, so for those that don't know me, for those that never seen me before, I was born with a super rare genetic disorder called Hanhart syndrome. And, you know, my parents went in for late ultrasound. They brought the baby up on the screen and suddenly the doctor started freaking out. And they were like, well, what's wrong? Wow. And they were like, well, from the looks of it, like your baby's limbs aren't being developed. Like we see his, we see his head, we see his heart, but like, we don't see like limbs and they thought it must be, it's gotta be a mistake, you know? And they looked into it and they're like, it doesn't look like his limbs are being developed. And they went back and they classified me before I was born with what we call hand heart syndrome. And it either leaves the babies with undeveloped limbs or undeveloped organs. So I was born in 1996. At the time of my birth, I was the 12th baby in medical history that they've ever seen it happen to. And out of the 12, eight of those babies passed away due to undeveloped organs. Right. And so they're, they're the babies are born and they can't breathe on their own. They can't eat on their own. And they later on pass away. And so they came back in and they were like, this is the case. He has about a 30 percent chance to live. And, you know, the room got quiet, I'm sure. And yeah. it's like as a parent, like, what do you do? How do you like react to that? And in that moment, my parents made a decision that they were going to totally block off the, the scenario that I wasn't going to survive and only give energy towards the fact that like, we're going to go through with this and we're going to see what happens and talk about leaning into faith and not fear, you know, and, and that really stretched my parents. And I, and I have the opportunity to like interview my parents and ask them about that moment. And it's one of those moments where you have no idea what you're going to do. And you only, you're only reacting because you're in the situation. You never prepared for that. Right. And I think that's life. A lot of the times, a lot of the times we can pretend like we know what we're doing until stuff hits the fan and you just got to navigate it. So for them, they said, Hey, we're going to, we're going to go on with the pregnancy. Like we're not, they wanted to abort me. Um, or they said, if he's born, you should institutionalize him. Like you should give him away, like all these different things. And my parents had to fight through all of that. And so if you think about it in 1996, 
I'm 27, 27 so when they years see, ago. So when they yeah. see this on the, on the ultrasound, right, they're basically seeing this super early and basically giving your parents, like, worst case news. Do you really want to go through with this? You try to talk them out of it. And again, at the time, you're the only the 12th baby in history. Like, they probably don't have much even knowledge yeah. on it. Yeah. What's crazy Gosh. about it is, like, right now, I'm, I'm expecting a little girl. And my wife is 19 weeks pregnant this mo very moment. And we're going through all that. So we, we're going to the ultrasounds. We're seeing the OB. Um, we're, we're doing the genetic testing. Like, genetic testing is great. There's no um, chromosomal you know, malfunctions or, or deformalities or anything like that. But like, you know, us as, as, as people expecting our first child, like we just, it's almost like a little bit of us, like, I don't know, how are we going to take bad news? Like if, if something is off, like, are we going to, what's our reaction? And it's like here, like us as individuals, like being on this earth, we're already miracles in itself because we are one of billions of sperm cells that Fast made it swimmers, to the, baby. <laughs> yeah. Made it to the egg. Right. <laughs> But like, so we're miracles in, in general. Like when people look at their life and they, they're, they're like, oh man, I'm lonely, I'm depressed. I don't feel valued. I don't feel like I'm worthy. I'm like, you are worthy. Like you were born for a purpose, for a reason. You're here, go find it. And you, you're not only a miracle, you're a marvel. You're like a unicorn in this world because your, your chances of being here were ultimately up to your parents and they decided to persevere and say, you know what? We're going to love him no we matter what. Like we choose faith. faith. We yeah. choose that he's, he's going to come out here and he's going to be something. He's, it, this is not going to limit him. We're going to get all, into all that, like yeah. your, your modifications in life and all that. But it's just amazing, man, that, that, um, that you're here. I mean, you, we're able to have this conversation. I'm pumped. Did they know? Yeah. Did they know? So, and again, I, I'll, I'll let you go back into it. I mean to cut you off, but did they know that it was either be the limbs or the organs at this point seeing mm. an ultrasound? Like, that's a great question. Are they, cause I'm assuming it's probably one or the other. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's a great question. So they knew it was the limbs. Um, and I'm sure they could see the heart and the heart was, was fine, but I guess they didn't know how, like if it would continue to develop. Mm. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a great question. So when I was born, um, and, and by the way, just go back to what you were saying is even me or even every anybody listening that has has all their arms and all their legs to exercise that muscle of realizing like i've already won and operating from that place oh, yeah. that's a magic that's a superpower right because oftentimes you can have there's we, we know to be true there's people with all their arms and all their legs and they're like i'm not enough i'm still missing something and if you can remind yourself of like i've already won and everything else is additional and serve from that place more magic comes into your life Right. And True. so, but for me, totally understand, even when I'm in my poopy diaper, right. Cause I'm human yeah. is understanding, like I wasn't, I was supposed to die. Yeah. Right. Let's be real. Like I wasn't supposed to be here. They also told, they also told the doctors that my face was messed up. That was a big lie too. I'm beautiful. I'm handsome. Yeah, right. So they were lying stuck. all the time. Right. Good looking and, dude. So, and so if, if everyone can remind themselves that they're, they've already won, they can move closer to wholeness. And that's the whole intention of this human experience is to get back to wholeness. Can I go down a rabbit hole? Is this yeah, okay? That's good. Right. Absolutely. Um, go for it. And, and people, look, people look at me, depending on how much people follow me, that you may see on my profile mur murals of Christ. You may see a crucifix. And I always let people know they're like, oh, you're, you're religious. Like, no, no, no. I, I, my relationship with Christ is way different than the people in, in, pe people in the church. 100%. The truth is I wouldn't hang out with most Christians. I'm going to go there. Right. It's like I wouldn't hang out with most people that are reading the book. And my relationship with Christ is that he was an offering, right? And so regardless of whether he was real or not, whether the story was real or not, if I read the story and look that he gave his life, he's an offering. So I can take that principle and say, regardless of me having no legs and arm, my intention is to build myself into the greatest version of a man and give it to the world. I'm, this, this podcast, give, your, give, 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 Nick, give, Nick, give back, right? It's like the whole thing is like, yeah. If I can help enough people get what they want, I can have anything I want in life. And so each and every one of us are offerings, especially as men, right? It's like your duty is to build yourself into the greatest version and give everything that you have. Um, so that's one thing about, about Christ. But the other thing is Christ said he was coming back, but right. that I don't believe that means he's physically coming back. I think wholeness, Christ consciousness, but wholeness is coming back. We're so far, far gone from wholeness. 
We're so far away from love and joy and gratitude and all the beautiful emotions that you want to see. You ask most people in America, if you go to most people in America and say, are you happy? They don't know. They think happiness is a fairy tale because they don't have evidence that happiness is possible these days. Yeah. So I don't believe that a physical being is coming back. I believe as human beings, we're walking ourselves back to wholeness. Yeah. And if I can be a, a mirror, if I can be an example of like, wow, this guy has no legs, he has one arm, but he's heart centered, he's serving and he loves life. Maybe I can walk a few people back to wholeness before I go. Mm. That's so powerful because like, that's so true, man. I mean, our life is a living sacrifice for others. Like we are here to bless other people. We're here and, and it, in, in the process of blessing other people, we are now blessed. Mm. And it's like, a lot of people, they go and chase the dollar. They go chase the money. Go be financially stable. Go be financially free. But at what point do you now start getting the greatest fulfillment of life when you start serving people? If you, when I go to church, I, I go to a church and, and there's a, a couple of wealthy, very big donors at the church. And one guy, he, he pulled up in a really nice car and, you know, did this, did that. And he's like, dude, the greatest, the greatest enjoyment I've ever had in my life was writing a check to a church, knowing that that check then went to go and build a, um, a school in Africa, yeah. you know, like I literally wake up every day knowing that I cannot believe I was part of that. And it's just sacrificing hard earned money. Cause he was a guy that came from nothing. And so you're absolutely true, man. That was completely powerful. What you just said. Yeah. I, and, and don't get me wrong. It's like, we talk about, if we talk about energy and vibrations yeah. is the desire for fame and the desire for money are the two lowest vibrations, but go get lost. Whew. <laughs> go get lost in it please yeah, yeah, right yeah. because most people don't want to be, oh, i'm lost in life i don't know what i want to do outstanding because guess what my friend on the other side of loss is what found. is found and so yeah. the only way you're going to find yourself is if you lose yourself yeah. so go lose yourself i've lost myself in desire for fame i've lost myself in desire for money but the more lost i am the further the, i know how far away i am from home mm. that's in every lost story that i know man like everybody that's Gained the fame, but feel, still felt empty. I remember Zeke telling me, he's like, I, first time I ever made money in my life, it's like, I was, you know, you're you driving down with a really nice car, but it's like, I'm driving down the road with a really nice car, but I still feel empty. Like, what's going on? What's going on? Yeah. I thought it was it. Yeah. Yeah, when I got the money, I thought it was it. And the truth is, we don't essentially want the money. We want the money how, how it's going to make us feel. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want the Lambo. You want how the Lambo is going to make you feel. And then, and by the way, don't get me wrong. Go have materialistic goals. But have materialistic goals with the understanding that you cannot fill a spiritual hole with something materialistic. Yeah, hundred percent, without a doubt. It's so true. where did you? How did you? How did you get to this place of, of understanding that my life? I'm I'm sitting here to be a servant. I mean, the, I was always I was always told the the way you truly serve God, the way you truly serve Christ is by serving others. The way you really show God you love Him is by serving others. Right. Yeah. Where do you, where, where did, at what point did that come into, like, where was that instilled into you of like, you know, I'm sitting here to serve because I mean, call it what it is, like with one arm, like I would have tried to make every excuse in the world why I'm not sufficient enough to serve anybody. Yeah. I'll, I'll start the, the answer with, I'm glad you're meeting me now. <laughs> you're meeting the best version of myself. Yeah. Right. And so I'm 27 for 20 years of my life, I was a victim. Mm -hmm. I was a victim of the situation. I was a victim of being born with no legs but arm. Why me? Why do people have to make fun of me? Girls don't like me. I can't feed myself. I can't be a man. Like we can go into all that pain, right? Of like, because we went from birth and then we kind of jumped, but I wasn't always this way. And I was a, a massive, a massive victim. You know, there is spurts and moments of happiness, but it would get drowned out by maybe remarks from kids or girls not liking me or I can't ride a bike like the other kids and all the all the things that I've struggled with which we can dive into I think I think I got a taste of what contribution felt like I think there was a moment in my life where I felt the fuzzy feeling of fulfillment that we're all seeking I said oh what's that feeling you know like where did that come from and when I got that fuzzy feeling it was a moment where I was I was a wrestler and we can dive into all this right we got some time Right. Yeah, but I was a wrestler and I, I always lost, you know, I had like two wins my senior year, but I would always just get my butt kicked and I had a great time doing it. And I came off the mat one time, 
clearly lost. And this lady came up to me, she's like crying. I'm like, oh, go oh God, what did I do wrong now? Like, <laughs> did you not just see that performance? Like, just got, I just got murked, right? And she's like, Nick, I wanna thank you. I'm like, what, like for entertainment? Like, what do you got, you know? And she said, my daughter's over there in the sideline and she never saw you in her life and she never wanted to do sports. And like, after, you, after she saw you on the mat, like she's asking me to go run track and field. Wow. Like she's never wanted any of that. You not only motivated her, you not only inspired, but like you shifted something in her perspective. But I don't want to thank you. And a light bulb moment went off. I was like, maybe there's something here because that makes me feel good. How can I get more of that feeling? Because I feel like enough. And who knew that I can feel like enough by serving others and giving them value, right? And so I think there was, that was a specific moment where I got the light bulb. And that's what we call evidence, right? The brain is the best detective and the brain's always going to try to find evidence to prove yourself right. So based on your beliefs, your brain's going to be a detective and find evidence. So for example, if you got cheated on and you're like, oh, all girls are cheaters, your brain now believes all girls are cheaters. So you'll find or create evidence to prove that all girls are cheaters. Yeah. You'll find it, you'll self-sabotage it. It's the same thing with people are like, oh, I always have terrible bosses. It's like, the boss may not be terrible, but you'll create the terrible in the boss to prove your beliefs right. That's why yeah. we have to be very conscious of what we believe. And so I got evidence that serving others made me feel good and I wanted to do more of that. And from that moment, it led me into the chapter of being a prankster in Vine. And we can go wherever you want to go. Yeah, I mean, I just want to, I want to go, I want to go back even a little bit farther because I, I actually, I, I heard you in a, a video of yours talk about you didn't really realize you were different until you got into like middle school and high school yeah right like i'm i'm curious what that childhood was like you're you're trying to figure out life completely different. somebody's trying to figure out how to crawl and then walk like you're trying to figure out how to you know do everything in in between without legs and in two you know two arms yeah what what was the childhood like and at what point was there a shift and you talk about some of the struggles that you went through yourself i'd imagine when you got to those ages i mean i know when i was in in middle school like i dealt with stuff like kids are just nasty kids yeah. are mean kids are hateful and there's a lot of judgment there's a lot of just you know drama and you know just nasty things that are said out of young kids who just don't know any better what was your childhood like and at what point was there a shift and i'm sure you dealt with a lot of just difficulties yeah. in that childhood. For sure. So I've, I'm a firm believer that, and there's evidence everywhere, is re, you can have all your arms and all your legs yet still be handicapped by your upbringing, right? So I'm not the only one handicapped out here from yeah. our upbringing, right? It's like we all get specific. I may have physical disabilities, but based on the upbringing, you have additional disabilities or um, handicaps in the mind that get, get thrown on you. Yeah. But for me, I was the baby, so I have you know, I had, have two sisters, I have a brother who passed, we could talk about that. And the, the story was they, they brought me home, I was like wrapped up and they never told my siblings that I was different. They never like, were like, hey, like he's got no legs, one arm. Like they never put emphasis on that. And basically they brought me home and they like put me on the floor and unraveled me. And I, I'm pretty sure my brother was like, cool you know like <laughs> this is so cool and like look at his hair like they were like he's different like because if you put emphasis on it it makes it weird yeah. right so they're just like yo here's your brother yeah like, what's good you yeah. know like here's your brother and so that was how they introduced me to the That's family cool. right and then i have to you know give it up to my parents and the upbringing is like they knew that if they treated me different then that would really ruin me you and so my dad, my dad even told me as like an adult, he's like, yo, he's like, if I would have put stepping stools everywhere and little loops on like zippers and stuff for you, he's like, you would have got smacked in the face when you left the household anyway. Right. And so he's like, I was just trying to set you up. Like no matter how hard it was to see you fail, I, I wanted to set you up so you were good. Yeah. So they would do things like my mom would, you know, at the age where I can think, right. Like for myself, they would like put my clothes in front of me and she'd be like, okay, try it out. I'm like, what? What do you mean try it out? You know, like, and I, I try to put my shirt on and I mess with my shirt. And then she would like pick her, her shirt up, you know, to the shirt on with one finger and be like, this is how, maybe try this. But they would never do it for me. Wow. They would never do the work for me. Then, now, when I'm a baby, baby, they're clearly, sure. they're feeding me and changing right, me, right? Sure. When I get to a certain point, they're like, all right, Nick needs to develop life skills. And so, okay, they transition and they put me in a high chair and they put food in front of me and they put a spoon there. 
and they put some Cheerios and they're like, okay, figure it out. And I finally realized that I can flick the spoon off and just lick my finger and eat Cheerios that way, <laughs> right? So I figured out how to feed myself, That's right? Good. So, but, but that, you talked about rite of passage, right? You talked about rite of passage b- before he jumped on as like, they were showing me the rite of passage, right? Yeah. The, the passage of becoming a man or becoming uh, someone who can develop skills. Like you have to go through something to go, you have to go through something to get to something. Yeah. And so they put me in a environment where it's like, you either figure it out or like, we ain't going to help you. You know, like we can support you, but you've got to figure it out on your own. And I think just for the audience, there was two massively important things that programmed my brain at a very, very early age. The first thing is I was best friends with failure. It wasn't a negative. Yeah. The meaning that I gave failure was, okay, this is a part of the process. Everything that I do takes a lot of time me trying to get on a chair, me trying to feed myself, putting my clothes on. Failure was everywhere. So I was used to it, right? That was my boy. Yeah. I knew that if failure was around, like eventually I would succeed. So my relationship with failure is not negative. I run towards failure because the faster that I failed, the faster that I would succeed. So that's one thing, superhuman programming at a very early age. Yeah. The second thing was by them not doing the work for me, it programmed my brain to find solutions. Yeah. So Nick didn't spend time focusing on the problem. He spent time focusing on the solution. Now, if you look into the world, most people spend their energy focusing on a problem and complaining about it, talking about it, staying in the problem versus shifting their energy towards solutions. Mm. So those were the two most powerful things that that upbringing, like as a baby gave me, was empowering relationship with failure and becoming solution oriented. Dude, I don't even know when like, like so many things are just going through my head right now. Like you're like the definition of like the... A victim mentality has everything to do with staying a victim and little to do with becoming a victim. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you become a victim, it happens. Now it's like, you gotta make a decision like what you're saying. It's like your greatest accomplishments, everything you do right now, dude, like me getting to see you and meet you and, and, and you doing things that are, you're doing more things with literally one arm and one finger than most people out here with every limb that they have because you chose not to stay a victim and you chose not to have a victim mentality. Say we're in a video game. I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole. Say we're in a simulation, say we're in a video game, right? Here's our avatars, here we're walking around and say it's medieval times though, right? And we're in a video game and everybody's in town and you see a man with no legs when I roll up on a horse, he's got a bag full of money, he's got Princess Peach or the princess and you're like, what cheat codes does he have in the video game? Like, oh, he has less than me, but he has more. Like, I don't understand this. It's psychology. It's the thinking. It's yeah, the beliefs. Yeah. It's the way that I view things. It's the meaning I attach to things, right? So we can dive into all that, but I, like, that's a big piece that people need to understand is like, this life is available for all of you. It's available for each and every one of us. I'm not stronger than you. I'm not taller than you. I may be prettier than you, but I don't know what it is, but I, I just have better psychology. Mm, yeah. And the majority of life is psychology and you can even have mechanics in front of you and strategies and tools. But if you have an elevated psychology, you start to use the mechanics differently as well. Yeah. But all about you too, Nick, is that you've got a faith about yourself too. So it makes you a very smart, great person. Say it again. Person. I have what? You have a faith about yourself. Mm. You have, you have something that's just very bright about you, man. It's like you talk about life's a lot about psych- psychology and it's like, there's, there's two type of vict- uh, villains out there, right? They're the ones out there that want to see the world burn, <laughs> right? Those are the ones that are super smart, but they use their smarts for evil. Mm. And there's ones out there that just hate their life, right? And they just, whatever they do in this world is just a byproduct of what they entertain and, and they just enjoy just being evil, right? Now, you talk about psychology just being one of the biggest things in life. It's like now that you have great psychology and you've got something that you can pull from where your values and your morals come from. Now you're just a very smart, good person. Mm. And I think, you know, that's literally the human existence. Yeah. You know? Thank you. Thank you. What, were some of the, what were some of the biggest uh, that you can remember as being at young, right? Like what were some of the biggest struggles and frustrations you had that, you know, you talk about, about brushing your teeth or you talked about feeding yourself, right? Yeah. What were some of the biggest struggles that, you had to figure out because I think it's really cool that your parents had had the had the understanding of what 
you what was really important for you because they could have handicapped you sure. really sure. bad, yeah, yeah. right? So what were some of the struggles that you really faced as a kid that now are just like second nature to you? Like when I watch you, it's so mind blowing because oh, man, I want to open the door. I want, you know, and you, it, it's just like, you, you probably don't even think about it now, right? But I'm sure as you were young, there were some things that were like really hard to figure out and frustrating. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think, I think in the beginning though, like going back to like, I didn't really realize I was different is I was just like so pure and I just got a lot of help, right? So like I had an aide that pushed me in school. Um, I figured out, I guess it was difficult. I figured out how to write um, at an early age. So putting like the pencil here and like writing like this. So I figured out writing. My sister was a gymnast. And so where you see me hand standing onto like things, like she created that. Like, hey Nick, if you like try to flip your body up into the couch, like you probably get it. Yeah, yeah, so now I'm like hand standing. Yeah, I just saw you do that. Yeah. I was like, I can't even do that. Like, he has the core. So, I mean, yeah, so just... so she she helped me with that. I think. I think the most difficult thing, and that even me reflecting on, it, I'm like, there's not difficult things, you know. But I think the most difficult thing was, friends and girlfriends. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I yeah. think like if I were to look at like screw a pencil like give me a girlfriend you know like yeah. i don't need to, i don't care how to write like i want to fit in i want to i want to be loved right everybody right. wants to be loved exactly. and so there was a i'll give you an, uh, an example there was a moment where i was we we're playing recess and i always had great friends though i will say that like the the school the the kids who vibe with me they they always took me under the wing and i always had like pretty good pretty good friends and so there was a time where we were playing recess and they, they were playing kickball and they were like, yo, Nick, play kickball. And I'm, I'm like, okay, like try this out. But they were like, you can have someone kick for you. And so I like, I would like pick the biggest kid. I'm like, you kick, I need as much time as possible to get around the damn bases. So I need the kid who can, who can smack the ball far. And, uh, he kicked the ball and I, and home run, he m murdered the ball. And I, and I, I remember I, I got a home run and I still know the kid's name and I won't, I won't call him out, but he, uh, he said, to the catcher he said how are you gonna let a cripple score on you mm. and i'm so in it like i'm so in i don't even know what the word meant bro but i knew it was like negative and i knew right, it had this right, negative yeah. meaning and it made me feel like disgusting it made me feel less than and like the thought process was like mm. yo like i can't even play a play i can't even go do recess without someone make fun of me so there was experience like that 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 had me develop beliefs there was another experience where i was on a school bus and I was about 13 years old and there was a, a I know her name too. It's funny, like, let's, let's back up here. Trauma is an emotionally charged event, yeah. right? And the brain always remembers it. And so you may not remember what they were wearing or what they look like, but you always remember how they made you feel. Mm -hmm. And essentially maybe their, their feeling is tied to their face or tied to their name. And so I was on a school bus and this girl was like making fun of everyone. And she looked at me and she was like, I don't even have to start with you. You're already too screwed up anyway. And it wasn't coming from a man. It was coming from a girl. And so then the meaning that my brain creates was like, girls think I'm disgusting. She's right. Like I started to believe it. Yeah. yeah. I'm I not guess that's, that. that's what, cause I just remember how I felt being in middle school. And again, Somebody could say something about me and I truly believed it a hundred percent to the core. Yeah. Did you have to undergo a lot of self-talk for yourself? Like as far as like just to, to shake off the, the belief that was being molded about your disabilities um, that people were saying about you and inflicting upon you. Did you ever just have to just say, you know what? Like, no, this is not going to limit me. Like I'm going to go prove them wrong. Like I'm going to, I'm going to go do, great things right now like was there any po point of that life that shift that happened for you i wouldn't even commu communicate this to any of my family because yeah. i didn't want to be a burden mm, right okay. so like i That's like good. it's nick yeah you know he's the happy smiling look at him he's so inspirational and he's yeah. got like this is our baby boy right yeah. so like i had this like my my sister's like you're the golden child i'm like shut up uh, but like they call me this like golden, like, oh, you're the, you're the golden child of the family. So it's like, if I'm off, everybody's off. I was like the glue of the family. Mm. So I didn't even communicate it. My sister didn't even know that I had suicidal thoughts until she saw a podcast when I was an adult. Yeah. Mm. She had no idea. Wow. Right. And, and then also 
based on the way that your parents act, you want to be like your parents or like you, you want to be like your dad. And so we can go into this whole other rabbit hole of like, my dad is like, he's shifting now and he's, he'll watch this he's a raving fan. I love you. Um, but he's a hard <laughs> ass, right? Like he was like, he's the type of like came up from a, a very tough upbringing from the streets, shot a couple times. Like he's, wow. he's hard. Right. Yeah. And so you see a man that never cries. You see a man that just always gets it done. You see a man that regardless of whether he's sick or not, he's going to work, right? Like that's what you see. And so it's like, okay, I, I don't see him complain about anything. I don't see him cry to anyone, open up about his feelings. So like, I'm going to act in alignment with that. I don't, I don't, I'll, I'll handle it, right? I'll handle, like, I'll just suppress. And so you suppress and suppress and suppress. And I think, I think I had things to soothe, right? So we, we, Instead of dealing with things, we soothe as human beings, right? All of us, regardless of what it is, we either soothe with food, we soothe with alcohol, we soothe with porn, we soothe with video games, we soothe with scrolling. Especially now more than ever, we will soothe so we don't feel the emotion. Exactly. Which is terrible because in order to heal it, you have to feel, you it, feel it. Right? Yeah, but we weren't sure. taught this, by the way. Right. Like, and if you're, if, you're, if you're listening right now, you're like, I, I had no idea. It's not your fault. Yeah. We weren't taught this. Right? I wasn't taught this. I didn't know. I had to go find this information when I was an adult. Yeah. And so I would soothe with food. I'm an Italian boy. I was chubby as, chubby as hell. Right? I love food and video games. That was the way that I soothe. And you also have this element. This is a pretty interesting conversation. But you also have this element where regardless of whether the soothing for Nick was bad or not, it's like, well, let him go. He's got no legs and one arm. Like, let him eat. Let him play video games. Like, right. it's, it's hard. Right? Yeah. And so then almost the soothing is rewarded yeah right because they don't know how to, they don't know right so I'm not, I'm not blaming anyone they just don't know so the shift was <clears throat> the i would i'll firmly say the thing that moved me from light to dark was trying to get validation for women mm. that was the biggest pain so when you when you look at when you look at <coughs> humans changing humans will change for two reasons you either change for pain or you'll change for pleasure but oftentimes humans will always run away from pain faster than a run towards pleasure. That's why essentially we don't start going to the gym or really taking it serious until the doctor's like, yo, you're gonna die. You're like, oh damn, maybe I should get my life together. Or you don't lead the relationship until it becomes physically abusive or emotionally abusive. Or you don't fire the person in your organization until they burn down the culture. You're like, maybe I should get rid of this person. So oftentimes we have to hit a pain threshold as humans in order to shift. The pain of women, or at that time girls, right? Some 17, 16 year old boy, the pain of girls and not being loved was the shift where I was like, I want it like demon time, right? Like as in this day and age, like I'm gonna go demon time, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> figure my life out. Yeah. And for me, the shift was, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna become a wrestler. My older brother was a wrestler. In Jersey, wrestling was a massive deal. And girls like wrestlers. So if I can become a wrestler, oh, here we go. Maybe Nick's got a success rates going up here. Like maybe I can change it. But also not only maybe will the girls like me, but I'll be labeled as an athlete. Yeah. And, and that's dope. Right. If I, <laughs> right, like, let's be right, real. It's right, like, right. yo, if I could become an, oh, I'm an athlete. Right. Yeah. And I thought wrestlers are the most badass thing in the world. Am I allowed to say that? Like the most badass Ooh, thing, yeah. badass thing ever. Right. And so I'm 16 years old and Nick's like, yo, we're going demon time. Like we gotta, we gotta, we gotta start loving ourselves. I gotta figure something out because I also understood like, Homeboy, you ain't changing no legs but arm. Right, right, right. Like, maybe in the future, but like, there, like you're not changing no legs but arm. And like, you, the the conversation was like, you talk, you talked about suicide, but you don't have the balls to take your life. We know. I want to go there because right? I want to go there though because I was I've been there in my life. Like, how real was that for you? Like, where you know you having these thoughts, you got to be in like a very dark place. You know, when you start having those thoughts, that life's not good enough anymore, right? Like. What age is this, and how did you overcome that? Because being in that phase is, is really hard to pull yourself out of. Yeah, great question. I think as a 16, 17-year-old kid, the thoughts were prominent. Like, I don't like my life. I don't want to live in this body anymore. And I didn't take any action on it. I would... I would cry in the shower, so no one knew I was crying, right? Nick, why are your eyes red? I got soap in my eyes, right? Like, there was always an excuse. Yeah. Or I would lock myself in my room, play video games, and totally numb out, right? So I had, I had to numb it out. Um, to fast forward a little bit, we, we can jump wherever you want. 
but there was a moment where I got the closest and it was my 21st birthday celebrated in Miami and everybody that I was with brought back a girl and who did it mm. Me. Mm. and evidence I'm stacking evidence yeah right and I'm like all of it all the said negative self talk like of course you didn't like they don't like you like you'll you'll never have that right and it was a Miami high rise and I went out on the balcony and I closed the balcony and I was like just sitting there and I'm like is this you really want to keep living like this or like do you want to end it like I'm I'm you know I'm having a conversation with my head and yeah. I pushed the, I scooted the chair over to the balcony and I got on top of the chair and I'm like looking over the balcony and I'm like, hey, whatever you want, bro. Like if, if this is what you want, you want it. And I don't even till this day, I don't know what stopped me from doing it. I think the thoughts start to think about like, yo, my family is going to be wrecked. Right. Like Nick, you like, come on. Like I started getting grounded, right? Like Nick, your family's going to be wrecked. Um, it's not that like I'm now I got devil and angel right on both shoulders and they're like they're like it's bad do it it's like no and then you're, you're it's all focused right and I I think I cried myself to sleep on the bat and I and I slept out there that night and did you ever tell did you tell anybody like your boys the next morning right did you like, did no. they even know they didn't even know where you were at, at that point in your life no I didn't I didn't tell anyone. I think also because we're programmed, like if you talk about that, you're weak, yeah. right? That whole man, be a man thing, it's right? It's like the head. bad programming. Yeah. Um, and they, but they, they also knew that women were a bit massive pain point for me. And they also persisted until I got evidence. Like, hey, look, you did it. You know, like now what? Bro? They'd make fun of me. It's like, okay, now what, bro? Like you, you feel the, you know, like, it's, it's not all that, you yeah. know? And so like, but they definitely, they definitely sculpted and, and helped me cultivate like the confidence. Where did that shift? That. Where did that shift? Cause bro, we'll call it what it is. I've seen you with some good looking women, bro. There, <laughs> there, there, I mean, I, you know, there was that, there's definitely a shift in, in that. And I know we're like jumping back and forth, but this is great. You Sorry. go from talking about, I, I, I didn't bring a girl home to, I've seen you with beautiful women, bro. Yeah. You know, you've, I, you've dated beautiful girls. Like, there's something inside of you that's like, you know, has got, a whole nother you know, level of... He's got something that other men don't have. And it's... He's not, he's not a victim. You know what I mean? Like, he... Like the, just to, I know we're jumping around, but like, dude, like the importance of a father. Like, did your, did your father tell you he loved you? Has he, has he told you he loved you before? Yeah. Has he told you he was proud of you? Yeah. Has he acknowledged you as, as your son or as his son? Yeah. So in, in scripture, in the Bible, whenever Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist, a voice came from heaven and said, this is my son who, I'm who I love and who I'm proud of, mm -hmm. right? Proud, acknowledge, love. And a lot of times we become spitting images of our father, right? Your father was a heart, was present, yeah. right? I was, I was in a place, I was in prison where uh, they say 92% of prisoners, men, don't have fathers, yeah. Yeah. right? Just so happens they're in prison, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I have a similar dad, you know? He was a hard ass. I mean, he, but he loved me. He, I could yeah. tell he loved me. He, he made me feel it all the time, right? He acknowledged me as an athlete in front of all the other dads. That's my boy right there, yeah. right? And it's like, even with your limitations, he loved you, he told you he was proud of you, and he acknowledged you still as his son. Yeah. And a lot of times, when, like Zeke and I, we've lost our dads, and we think about how he's made us feel, but at the same time, it's like, we have a faith about ourselves. We have faith in something higher than us through Jesus. And so we draw from our father and we know that we want to please our father. Right. And so like, he's just different. I mean, yeah. he's different than all the other guys. And I think that's why he's able to uh, attract, you know, it's the laws of a little bit of shifted. Yeah. I got you. Something, yeah. I got you. something like, definitely shifted and like, I'm, you're still the same look, good looking dude, bro. Like, you know what I mean? Something shifted in perspective. And I, again, I don't know. I know you went into you. you I figured it out, though. I got it for you.
I, fig I figured it out. But I, I do want to back up real quickly. And I love that we can be all over here. And audience, just keep taking notes because we're going to be all over here. But there's value everywhere, right? Is oftentimes our parents love us, but not in the ways that we want to receive the love. Yeah. So then we believe that maybe they didn't show it, right? And so the brain will do three things. The brain will distort, it'll delete, and it'll generalize to prove yourself right. So if someone believes like their parents didn't love them, they will only remember the times where they didn't love them versus all the ways that they actually did love them until they started dissecting it. And so I think my dad did do those things. Um, I think when it came to like emotional intimacy and having deep conversations, that was not present. Right. It was very, it was very like surface level. Like we said, I love you and stuff, but I, I think when it came to let's talk about your emotions and let's work that, like they weren't taught that. So how are they going to give it to me? You know what I'm saying? And yeah. so that was just one thing that I wanted to know, like my model of the world. And I say this because my parents will watch this. My model of the world is my parents showed love with money and they showed love with food. Right. Especially Italian family. It's like we show love with food. Yeah. Um, for sure. And I think saying like i'm proud of you or acknowledge or loved on that way um wasn't maybe wasn't something that he got so he didn't know how to communicate it yeah. right and now there's this massive shift by the way i see you is there's a massive shift of like him being more loving and communicating using his words because yeah. um, no one was taught that now going going back to the the women thing i think the shift was that the the looks are important Right. So that's cool that I have that. But when you are heart centered, when you are grounded, when you are decisive and you're in a mature masculine, they don't even see the no legs and one arm. Wow. You're an authentic man. I mean, that's that's essentially what that is. I mean, you found what manhood is. Exactly. So it melts away. So there's been times where women and men will will say i totally forgot that you have no legs one arm because the presence is so big the centeredness is so centered and the groundedness is so grounded it's like most men aren't grounded most men aren't heart centered they don't know how to be decisive and they don't know how to lead and then you have a man with no legs and arm doing it all <laughs> like oh no brainer like yeah. and and then and then it's like evidence is evidence for women right so there's there's been times where someone will spend time with me and they'll say, I didn't know I could be loved in the way that you love me. Wow. Cause they never experienced it before. Yeah. But the big shift was realizing that it was an energy thing and not a, not a body thing. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest thing. Like when I, when I, um, when I realized that I felt so silly. But what happened though? Like what caused that shift? Was there like, it was there yeah. some was there some convention or retreat or something that you went to that like no I'll tell you what it is <laughs> life altering you, moment that I don't think it was one moment I think it was me stacking undeniable proof that I am who I say I am mm. that's confidence exactly that's, right? that's a quote stacking, that's a, I've heard that quote before stacking undeniable yeah. proof that I am who I say I am that's and confidence. so the energy going back to confidence and self worth yeah. and so. Okay, if, if we really dissect this, there was a period where Nick went from wrestler and then he went from prankster and then I went to bodybuilder. So then I got super shredded and I was super jacked and, and in great shape. And so let, let, let's dissect this too. You, if, you, if you're a girl and you see homeboy who's not in shape and then you see a man with no legs and arm that looks 10 times better than your boyfriend, <laughs> what is, they're like, yo step up or like what's good you know like or or even if it's just like analyzing you're like what what is that guy doing that my guy's not doing or like all these men that i dealt with in the past like they don't even compare to what he's doing like right. it, it's mind blowing so yeah. i think on the outside they can see the uh, that i'm purpose driven that i'm dedicated and I'm consistent and i'm doing more than most people with all their arms and their legs but i think internally for me it was right I, guys i spent a lot of time alone yeah like if, if we if we dissect this I've only been in one real relationship and it was for five years and I just left it six months ago. Yeah. That, and, and so, but before 22, between 19 and 21, I was, yeah, I was talking to girls, but I was, it's like when they said like, 
Jesus went off into the, the, the woods to pray. Yeah. And they're like, yo, where are you going? Like, we're celebrating. We're changing lives. He's like, no, I got to go be alone. Like, Nick went off and he, like, went alone and didn't, like, didn't seek validation from anyone. Was just like, yo, how can I just love myself? And I love, for me, I love myself through being consistent with my diet, be consistent with working out. I was, I love myself in the business that I built and the purpose that I had. And I started speaking, right? Yeah. And so then I, you, you look back after many years in private of like building something, you're like, yo, I, th I think I'm badass. Oh, wait, I'm actually badass. Look, look, look at all you created. Like you yeah. did it. Like you, you made it out. Like you, you've developed yourself into a great human. So I think that was the shift of like the man that I saw in the mirror I actually loved. And because I loved, I reflected that into the world that people started loving me mm -hmm. because everyone's a mirror everyone's a mirror for you so like what i don't like about myself i'll find it in you and what i love about myself i'll so find true. it in you as well and so, so true. i think it was just a vibe thing and that was the biggest hack let me let me address the audience here the biggest hack to body image is understanding that looks are great but energy mm -hmm. if the energy is immaculate you will attract an immaculate woman or immaculate guy and how you provide amazing energy is you do work on yourself and you find ways to love yourself and build yourself into a valuable human being and then give it to the world. And I think that is the transfer of energy that changed everything. Because, because I know I'm enough. Yeah. I don't need her to say, oh, you're so good. Look, it's like, girl, I already know. <laughs> oh, you're so smart. I already know. I, bu yeah. I built myself into this version. Yeah. So yeah. now you can't give me anything that I can't give myself. myself. Mm. Yeah. And because... I can give myself everything that you can give me. You're just additional. And now I'm not operating off of scarcity or like, I better, I better close this girl or I better get this deal or I better close the, 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 the deal. It's like, I've already known enough going back to wholeness. So Nick found his way to wholeness. And when Nick found his way to wholeness, everything's additional and abundance comes into my life. So now Nick's in a expansion state and not a contraction state. Let's break this down. Contraction states are suffering emotions. Right. Insecurity, doubt, fear. Yo, if you're insecure, can people feel you're insecure? They can feel it. Yeah, can the I girls feel, feel you're insecure? Sure. Yes. Can the girls feel that you don't need them? 100%. It's a totally different vibe, right? So contraction emotional <laughs> states. Spit, spit. Come on. Contraction emotional states are insecurity, de depressed, whatever you want to call that, unconfident, um, inadequate, not enough, fear. And then expansion states, when you're out there expanding and growing, you're in gratitude, you're in joy, you're in yeah. certainty, you're, you're in all the beautiful motions. And so I just feel that with my focus and the tools that I have, I know how to be in a beautiful state and I'll attract beautiful things into my life. Wow. Dude, that, that blew me away. That's deep. That's deep. You know what's so crazy, man, is that like everything you're talking about is just, it's, we were talking about earlier, the authentic man. And it's like when you can operate from a, an emotionally sound place, an emotionally intelligent place, mm. to, a, yeah. to a theologically intelligent place, to a mentally intelligent place, from a uh, psychologically intelligent position, um, all of the physical stuff about somebody, that's why you see like sometimes people are like, how did he score her, mm. right? Yeah. I'm like, well, just go hang out with him for 30 minutes and he'll probably score you too. And, and, and you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I see all the qualities in the guy now, yeah. you know? And so it's just like, yeah, man. I mean, dude, it's just, it's, it's Nick's the authentic dude. Bro, I do want to back up a little bit though. Real quick, ahead, real quick. That, that is a great point is, I don't know how this is going to come off. But I'm going to say it anyway, is no, what you real. said about emotional intelligence, men, please. If you can educate yourself on emotion, emotionally intelligent and, and become more intelligent, you just gave me a piece, like a download is the reason why a man with no legs of an arm is able to attract beautiful women is because I can stimulate them in a different way than you can. 100%. And I stimulate the mind and I stimulate the heart and I stimulate the soul. The looks are additional. I have those as well, but it's my ability to stimulate deep, meaningful conversation and not be a doofus. It is in the Bible, dude. It is in scripture. <laughs> How's that one? How's that one? Hey, give me you some. Just sound clip that one. Dude, you just spit scripture, dude, because in scripture That's it talks so about the woman as the, the more emotional being. Mm. So if a man can operate from a stance of emotions, it will understand what will emotionally charge her mm. to find me attractive. It's not, the, it's not the throwing money at you. It's not this. That's going to come to maybe a first date, mm -hmm. maybe getting laid maybe this, that, then he's going to find out how much insecurity you have because you're going to take her in the back room and start yelling at her and beating her because you're, you're done with her, right? But when you're in an emotional state and you know what she needs, right, which is 
the men, we're, we're at this place where like we, we, want, we desire respect, right? Well, women desire security. Mm. So if a woman respects a man, then the man's fulfilled. If a man gives her security, the woman's fulfilled. Yeah. And that's a fulfilled marriage yeah. or a fulfilled relationship. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm, dude, this is a great podcast. <laughs> you know, I just want to go back because we, all, we, we skipped a point that we did both want to talk about was your, 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 like your viral time where you went really crazy on Vine, right? Yeah. yeah. And we were watching the, the Oh, dude, the and, pranks, yeah. the Walking Dead pranks. Yeah. Dude, you pranked Daryl. <laughs> I did. Dude, I'm a Walking Dead fanatic. My <laughs> wife would know that I, yeah, I'm, I'm all about it. And like when we were watching, I was like, Holy crap. So you got casted. Like, did you get casted in one of the shows? So, so during that wrestling season, I created Vine and I was like, yo, let's like it. I want to create something that no one could do. No one could replicate. And I could kind of like be the category king of, and I was like, okay, well, let's Listen. dress me up as a zombie and like scare people, you know, <laughs> let's see if it works. And I went out to my local Walmart in New Jersey, which I'm not allowed in that Walmart anymore. And, <laughs> and I, that. Yeah, they kicked me out. And then, no, no good. And I stick out like a sore thumb. It's not like I'm going to sneak my way back into Walmart. You know? <laughs> and uh, um, I scared this dude, and he threw the paper towels at my face. And I was like, bro, it's just a prank. Uh, I looked at my camera guy. I was like, did you get that? He's like, I got that. And I was like, my goal was like 500 people. I was like, man, if this video can have five, like get 500 likes, this would be insane. And no joke, I posted that video. I went to sleep. And I woke up for school the next morning and it was the number one video on the app. Like wow. over Logan Paul, shout out to Logan Paul, uh, over Logan Paul, Jake Paul, all of these, all those pranksters at the time, I was the number one video. It had 80,000 likes and over 80,000 reposts. And I go back to school and everybody knows. They're like, oh, your video is <laughs> yeah. clout, right? Like validation. But, but by the way, you see how I fall, I fall into the validation. I'm getting all the validation, all the validation. Yeah. And um, so now I'm a wrestler. Now I'm... Any school that I go to the wrestle, rest, to wrestle, the cheerleaders are cheerleading for me. They're taking pictures with me. He's, he's the fine guy. He's a zombie prank guy. Yeah, now yeah, I'm famous. Yeah. I'm like, yo, this is crazy, like overnight. Um, but also, let, let's go to the pain part, too. Not all the comments are great. Right. Mm. Right. And if we really want to go down a, a dark hole, it's like one thing for me to read the comments, but it's another thing that I know my parents are reading the comments. And my parents are reading comments like they should have killed his dad so he couldn't reproduce. What a terrible sperm donor. Um, kill it before it reproduces. Like, you name any insult under the, under the sun I, I got when I was 18 years old. As an 18 year old kid, right? Famous overnight. And so that was an interesting thing, the battle, right? And that's all about a focus thing, right? If I, if I focus on those, that will become my life, right? If I focus on the positive things and the positive comments, that will become my life as well. You don't get the life you have, you get the life you focus on. So, now I'm, I'm famous in this Vine thing and I'm doing funny videos and everybody's loving it. And I come home on, from wrestling practice one day. My dad, I think I get the pranking from my dad. He's a prankster. And so I come <laughs> home, he's like, he's like, yo, he's like, we're, we're gonna go to Tokyo. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, Fox called me. Like they wanna hire you to scare the main actor of The Walking Dead and they're gonna pay you. And I'm like, bro, like cut, off, cut it out. Yeah. He's like, I'm not joking. Like here's the email and so I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And so we get on the call. They're like, they're like, listen, <coughs> we saw your video. You're perfect. We want to fly you out to Japan and do a prank on Daryl, but you can't tell anybody in your school. And you, and when we fly you out here, we have to take you like a, a, an alternate route because if he sees you, he's, he's going to know you're going to prank him. That's how they, everybody knew me. And so I got hired as an 18 year old kid. I'm um, actually my math teacher failed me because I went on that trip. I missed my midterm. Shout out to her. Um, hope your life's great. I'm doing outstanding, by the way. Uh, and I did the prank, and that went viral as well. And they paid me $10,000. I was 18 years old. I got 10 Gs. Yo, you know what the... I've never shared this. I don't think I've ever shared this on a podcast. The first thing that I did when I made $10,000 is I flew to California, bought a $1,600 Versace chain. Like an oh. idiot, like an idiot, oh, but it was man. super dope, Typical. right? So Typical I had a Versace. 18 year old. Yeah, bro, like yeah. balling out, you know? It was the same one that like Justin Bieber had in one video. Like, I don't know what I was doing, but I was just balling. I was, uh, balling. I was like, yo, I'm rich, 10,000. I'm like, I ain't never gonna work again. Like I'm rich forever. You still have that chain? Um, I do, I do. 
I do. It's in a box. A and I never even wore it. It's, never a even, it's obnoxious. <laughs> um, and so That's that good. that that whole pranking thing took me off. And then I made the decision. I got accepted to the only college that I wanted to go to. Um, I decided not to go to college because I got an opportunity to move to L.A. to be a part of a show like Impractical Jokers. So basically, they pitched me. They're like, "Yo." The whole cast is going to be disabled. We can pull pretty messed up pranks. We want you to be the lead actor. This is what you're going to be, get paid. Blah, 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 blah. Great. I move out to LA. Two weeks after I signed my lease, so like, yeah, the show didn't get picked up. Like, have a good life. Oh, my God. I didn't know, I didn't know that works. And then yeah. on top of that, my roommate who I moved with, shout out to you, um, never paid rent, never got a job. The, the apartment was my name. And the cherry on top was my brother called me and said, I'm addicted to heroin and I need to come home. How old, are Low you? How old were you? This was 19 years old. Yeah. 19 years old, living in LA. I have my, I have my dad's he- voice in the back of my head like, told you so, LA is a city of the broken dreams of crackheads. You know, like I, I can just hear it. And, I, and then here I am like broke in my LA apartment. Um, I didn't even have a bed I was sleeping on. Um, I, would, I would put my clothes and like towels on a pile that I'd sleep on. I didn't have money. And I had 10000 and that's all I was. And I was, it was going quick, especially <laughs> after a $1,600 <laughs> Versace chain like an idiot, yeah. you know? Um, and so that was a really low point for me. And I, I felt like a, a failure, um, but also proximity is power. If, if homeboy around you isn't fired up, like it's hard to be fired up when someone else isn't fired up, right? Yeah. So like if you hang around with bums, you become a bum. And I was in a bum phase there for sure. And so I moved back home and I moved into the, the basement of my, my parents' house, my childhood home. Um, and I was like, I, I was like, Nick, what's next? Like, you got to figure out something next. But I also, I realized that pranking wasn't fulfilling. That was a big thing too. Right. I, I realized that it wasn't giving, giving me that true fulfillment and I needed to find something else. And I, I firmly believe that like, if someone out there right now is listening to this and maybe you're not fulfilled in what you're doing right now, it's okay. Just understand that it's a stepping stone to the next thing. Yeah. Right. Like I had to wear multiple hats until I found what I'm doing now. And who knows? I may not That's be good. a speaker forever. I may go make a rap album. You know, never know what Nick's going to do. Right? I've <laughs> yeah. worn a lot of identities. And so I moved back home. And that's when I had made the decision that I was, I was going to become a fitness model and a bodybuilder and monetize that way. And imagine going back home to your parents and telling them, I have no legs or an arm. I'm going to become a bodybuilder. Um, just bear with me. <laughs> and by the way, you can't snap your fingers overnight and be jacked. Yeah. It's like something you have to work on relentlessly. And so I, I believe I moved home at 19. And... I'm 27. I haven't stopped lifting since that moment. Did you lift prior to that? No. I mean, no. It probably wasn't really a thought. You were no. probably like, oh, I don't go to the gym. No, like, wrestling. Right. I wasn't lifting. Maybe yeah. like a little bit of wrestling, a little bit of lifting during wrestling, but no, I was more eating. What was that like the first time you went into the gym and you're like, oh shit? All right. Yeah. So how does that watch? Yeah, I yeah. watch you and your, you know, and how you 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 have makeshift things to be able to get, but. People don't understand, like, to contract certain muscles, like, you've got to be able to almost, you gotta like, have limbs. You gotta, yeah. I mean, you got to have limbs. Yeah. 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 yeah, for sure. So my buddy, my best friend, Josh, um, he was a wrestler friend, and he was yoked. He's still yoked up. And he was like, yo, just come with me at this time. And he was like, he's like my road dog. And we would just literally, we'd be in the gym two, three hours. You know, he'd do his workouts, then he'd work on me. He'd, like, push me, resistance. And then when I'm after... I got to a certain point where I moved to Tampa to continue bodybuilding and I met my other best friend, Cody, who basically sat me down and was like, yo, your form is terrible. <laughs> We're going to focus on micro movements. And, I, and if you listen to me, I will show you how to contract every single muscle in your body. So you, so you hit it. And I was like, I was like, a, it was like master Yoda or, you know, it's like Yoda. And I'm like the little sensei and like everything that he said, I was so so obsessed about micro movements and and making sure my stability and my form was yeah that that's how i was able to learn how to contract everything that's interesting that's yeah because being a being a um a former personal trainer like you i love figuring things out and so if you came in, into the gym and you like train me i'd be like this is going to be something new. Yeah. This is not something I learned in NASM or, <laughs> or getting this certification. Yep. It, it would have been, it would have been something crazy, man, because you are creating this new philosophy to train you. I mean, when I look at you, I'm like, how do you, so the, the side that doesn't have the arm, how do you work that pectoral? Yeah. So, so if I, if someone's with me, we could do resistance training. So like make sure shoulders back. Right. And just like, I can flex my whole pec just with this So that's motion, contracting. Right. So contracting. Yeah. 
um, and then resistant bands or I have a wrist wrap that I put on this and do it. And so for me, like I'm just in, I'm now in tune with the contraction yeah. and I'm over here like poking, you know, as I'm lifting, making sure everything's firing off. Enough. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't want to waste time. I want to make sure I'm getting it in, you know? Yeah. That's amazing. So when you were born, cause you have, you have a scar. Yeah. So what, what, what was, what did the extremities look like when you were born? Yeah, so this arm was about five inches longer than it is now, and my okay. bone was growing faster than my skin. Okay. So it was super sensitive. Um, I couldn't really touch it on things. And I knew that I couldn't wrestle if my arm was sensitive. And so when I was 16, I told my parents, I said, can we amputate my arm? And they were like, are you, are you insane? I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, like, hey. And I was like, yeah, we need to cut this thing off. Um, I want to become a wrestler. That's how, but that's how much pain I was in, in the sense yeah. of like, I wanted to be confident. I wanted to be yeah. a wrestler. And so my sophomore year, they scheduled the appointment to amputate my arm. And so the doctors lasered five inches of, of my bone off, wow. pulled skin over, wow. um, and, and made a good, a good mallet to beat people over the head. Wow. I, yeah, that's dangerous. Yeah. No oh boy. But I could have told you it was a shark. <laughs> Sometimes I, it depends on the mood I'm feeling. I mean, someone think, think, about it, think about it if you didn't have one arm and a finger. You know what I mean? Like, that, you're probably, like, so incredibly... Grateful that you have that one Whoa. arm. <laughs> Dude, I mean, yeah, seriously, yeah. you're though, grateful like, for that one arm. <laughs> yeah. Watching you, you know, get you know how you how you how you drive your car, just simple as opening doors and just you know, that thing is like, God was like, you're good. Though. Yeah, you got, you got one. Though, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Make the most. Yeah. I wanna I wanna I wanna go into your your, your brother a little bit because I know that, you know that was probably a point in your life and I, you can you can paint the timeline and whatnot but you got this call in california from your brother who's like bro i, I need help right like i'm not doing well this is older brother younger brother older brother older brother yeah. and so what what was what was that experience like you know I, addiction's close to me i understand yeah. it i've been around it my whole life you know i've had friends that died from it obviously that was like a lot to deal with you know yeah when when he called me and said that I didn't even know what heroin was. Mm. Like that wasn't even in my, my, my vocabulary or my bandwidth. Mm. And so I'm like, okay. And so, you know, I packed my stuff up in a couple of weeks and I, I went home and me and my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law, we knew, but we thought we were doing him a favor by not telling anyone. Mm. Right. Like look out for bro. Right. Like bro struggling. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Like I didn't know what it was. And, and so then eventually, like, I kind of just like, I didn't know, to be honest, I didn't know how dangerous it was. Yeah. I, now that I'm reflecting, because I haven't even taken time but to I think back that. then at that time, this would have been like, what, 2015? So like, 2016? it was not the epidemic it is yeah. now in the sense of like, holy shit, we got a real problem yeah, here now. Like, that's a good point. It really wasn't that back then. So foreign to me. Yeah. Like, I didn't, I didn't know. So I didn't know the, the extent of it. And at that time too, my brother was, he's probably like six, seven years older than me. So there was like, when I, when I was graduating high school, I was just starting to build like a, a, a actual relationship with him. And then, and then that happens. And yeah, I just didn't know how, how dangerous it was, how dangerous it was. And then it was, I was really wasn't involved. Like he was always like in and out of the house or he was living elsewhere. And, th and then I'm, and I'm pretty sure for a long time, like the whole family just wanted to keep it hush hush, like, right? Like trying to hold a persona or a perception, yeah. right? So like everything was hush hush. Um, and that was, then he just went on a battle, bro, for, for years, um, a, a couple years after that. And then I got, it's so, it's so terrible. It's like almost like to the point where like we were preparing for that, that one call the way he wasn't going to come back. Right. Cause I'm, I'm pretty sure he had overdosed like a couple of times. Um, and like, you know, lived and there was, but there was also moments of sobriety, right. like sober. Like he's doing it and then like right back in the same proximity and you would probably see the difference. Yeah. When he was sober. Yeah. Like. Well, I th think of me, I'm, I'm 19 or 20 years old and I'm at that time I'm smoking weed with my brother and I'm like, why is he, why is he dozing off talking to me? Yeah. Maybe it's just, t maybe brother's tired. 
Like I didn't, bro, I'm so, I didn't know. Like I wasn't involved in any of that. And so then, uh, you know, I moved, I moved to, I lived in Tampa. He was still struggling. I moved to Vegas. He was still struggling. And, um, I mean, Christmas, Christmas Eve, like I saw him through a jail cell. Like it was, it was, it was rough. And I think I almost, if I'm honest, like I disassociated. It was to the point where I was like, I need to like totally love you from afar. Cause there were, there were times where like he robbed me, yeah. um, or took advantage of me. And yeah. now that I look at it, I'm like, that what's not, that's not Mike. Yeah. It's the drugs, right? It's not my brother. It's the drugs. It's not him when he's on it. Right. Um, and so I totally disassociated. Like I'm very, I'm very harsh when it comes to who I let in. And like, if you're not operating at a specific caliber or you're not empowering me, like you have to go. Like uh, my, I understand my assignment and my mission. Yeah. I, I, there's no energy can be wasted on that. Even blood, right? Like I'm just being direct. And so I was living in Vegas and I got the, it was my dad's birthday. Um, and I, you know, I FaceTime my dad and I'm like, I love you. How you doing? He's like, we're great. You know, um, enjoy your birthday. Let me know if there's anything we can do. And like two hours later, he called me. He's like, yo, I'm at the crime scene. Like your brother's dead. Wow. Like me and your, me and your, me and your mom are here. Um, the heroin had fentanyl in it oh. and, um, they robbed him right when he died, took everything he had, jumped out the window, closed the window to make sure, make it look like he was by himself. Like it was, it was d disgusting. Yeah. And he's like, I, I don't even have the strength to tell your older sisters, you know, can you do it for me? And so I called my sisters and let them know he wasn't coming back. And it took me six months to realize he was dead. Yeah. No idea. I literally got, I literally got off that call, called my sisters. And in a couple hours, I was in my closet teaching kids on a Zoom call. Just didn't hit you. Mm. Just numb. And I remember six months, six months later, I'm sitting in my bed and I'm deleting text messages, like clearing out my inbox and I see him and I clicked on it and I'm like, yo, he's dead. Yeah. And just bald and bald and bald. And that's the, that's the programming of not knowing how to deal with emotions or not like just getting right back into the grind or numbing ourselves with work or numbing ourselves with business to not feel things. And I didn't even know I was doing it. And so that was, yeah, that was that. We can go wherever, wherever you guys like. That was it. No, it just, it's, it hits me close. Cause again, I was, I was big brother for a long time. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and, you know, my little brother was in those situations where, you know, you had to see your mom and dad and see what they were going through and, you know, they're dealing with it and it's a lot, bro. It's a lot. And obviously now you're, you're involved with, we level up and, you know, that's kind of a part of you serving now. What what are you what are you doing in that field? Obviously it's close to you, so I'm sure you're passionate about that and seeing people recover. Yeah. It's definitely brought like the whole addiction pandemic into my awareness. Yeah. And even with, you know, we level up or anyone like I have I, I feel like now that I've gone through it, God, whatever you believe in, brings opportunities for me to like serve that community. Yeah. And so I've even had students come into my speaking program or like, hey, I run Sober Living. Can you come in? I'm like, done. Yeah. Right. And so um, that's how I've been. I've been able to, to, to give back is like serve that. And it's now in my awareness, but it was never in my awareness. And I feel like I feel like in, in, in to honor him is any time yeah. that I get to do do things like that or be involved like that, like I'm, yeah. I'm going to do it. Cause I didn't, bro, it's like everything with the human experience. It's like, you don't realize how real it is until it happens to you, yeah. you know, until you experience it or someone nearby experiences it. So I know that's a massive epidemic or pandemic, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And that's a whole nother rabbit hole. Right. It definitely is. Yeah. Cause it's, it's true. And, and, and your story, Zeke's story, my story, people ask me all the time, like, bro, how was prison? Like, yeah, I mean, like, you can go ask somebody how prison was, but I can't explain it to you because not many people out there have gone to prison as an innocent person. And it's mm -hmm. different experiences going as an innocent person because it's a hopelessness. Yeah. And, you know, Zeke's situation with, with drug addiction and, and having to carry on the burden of, of, of unforgiveness to him finally figure it out, like, what the root cause was at all. You know what I mean? It's like letting go of that. It's like you, you have no vocabulary. 
to explain the emotions that you've you felt unless you've gone through it. Mm. So where where are you at now? Because again, I mean, you're doing all kinds of cool stuff now. Um, super, you know, inspiring to me as a as an entrepreneur watching you serve others, but watching your platforms grow, watching you grow your mission. Like what is your focus is now in life? And, you know, there's obviously no limitations on you. So you, you know, what's, what's new with you? What is your focus? What is your, your mission in life now? Yeah, I will share in a way that I've never shared before. Cause I know you wanted to pull things out of me that I've never, never shared before. And not everyone's going to align with it, but at this point, I'm going to go real deep here. I'm going to take us real deep. But at this Let's point, I'm, I'm afraid of America. Um, like there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of left, right. We're, yeah. most, we're, more, we're most divided than we've ever been. And so my mission is to continue serving Right. So we have I have my speaking company where I go out and speak. And then I have my, my online education company. My online education company serves people who want psychology um, proximity to me. And then we help coaches, experts, entrepreneurs become transformational speakers. Right. Build the back end on that. So I have my students that I'm focused on. And my goal is to take all of my active income and all the people that have impacted, take that active income and put it into cash flowing assets. I want to get to fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a month in passive income, and I want to not spend most of my time here in America. Mm. Um, I think we're in a very interesting. I don't think we've ever experienced anything like this. You know, like you, even if you look, if you ask our parents, like, have you ever seen it this crazy? They're like, no, that like things are out of out of their mind, right? And so, I want to set myself up to where most of my stuff is virtual and I can, I can fulfill my, my client's needs virtually and spend most of my time in Colombia and spend most of my time traveling outside of America, um, making us currency and spending it elsewhere. And that's, we'll see how long that currency lasts as well. Yeah. Um, so I know that's deep, but I am, I'm aware, right. I'm aware of what's going on. It's like, yo, you can either, you, we can like sit around and we can like make money here and be like, Oh, that's a conspiracy theory and the power grid will never shut off or you know, like all this different type of stuff. But, but like, I'd rather be a prepared man than be a not so prepared man. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So I'm setting myself up strategically to where eventually if I do want to have children and family, it's going to be somewhere where I can where I feel great. But I'm just bro, I'm, I'm 27 and I'm like, I have no idea what the hell's going on here. And so I'm just going to do my best to figure it out. Make sure my my brothers are good and set up a game plan. Is that too much? No. Right? Because like no, I just, I mean, I've shit's popping off. Let's yeah. just, uh, I'm, I'm, let's just say shit's popping off. You know, like yeah. the world's crazy, right? No, you, you know, you know. I, I don't want to go here. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just plant this real quickly though. It's like if you look at our currency, our currency isn't backed by anything. It's Fugazi, right? So we're our paper isn't backed by anything. Yeah. And then why do and we can stop this, but let me just, let me just make this point is like, why do we need to tax people if we can print money? Right. Exactly. Shit don't make sense. <laughs> so I was like, okay, whatever's going on here, it's not good. I'm going to still create USD. I'm going to create US money, but I'm going to be strategic where I'm deploying my money. Like if we were going into like the wealth conversation, it's one thing to make money. It's another thing how to save it and how to deploy it. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm just setting myself up. So Nick can serve his people from a laptop and I don't need to be anywhere if I, I can be wherever I want, whenever I want with the people I want. That that's my answer. That's just, I mean, honestly, bro, it, you couldn't set it. You couldn't have said it any, any better because there's a lot of things right now that's going on in this country that just doesn't make sense. And it's, it's very, things could have been different. Things could be different. I asked my parents, I asked my mom that uh, the other day. I was like, has, have you ever seen it this way before? Like I'm young, I'm 28, around the same age as you. And she's like, no, it's never been like this. <laughs> it's like, and you want to talk about the inflation stuff. I'm like, I, I just don't see anything actively. We're both parties, man, like left and right's coming together. It's so divided. It's like, when you talk about like hatred and, and division and it's like, People are trying to cure racism with more racism, like with more division, with more prejudice. We're jacked up. We're all jacked up. It's like there's actually no true solution. And, and I, I, we are literally a godless nation. 
Like we have become a godless nation. That's just how I see it, bro. Like it's like we, we've run away from what is good in this world. And we're, we're, taking, we're taking faith, we're taking God out of things we're, because we are running aimlessly with our heads cut off. 100%. And until we can come back to the Father, man, until we can draw back to the thing that will make us whole, that will literally give us the, th the answers, people will continue to run around with their heads cut off. It's as simple as that. And that's the nitty gritty of it. And, <laughs> but you're smart. You're smart on preparing and you're smart on knowing what to do with your income, with your finances. Uh, and not living year by year as far as financially, you know, it's great to live in the moment, but at the same time, it's great to also plan yeah. for the rest of your life, you yeah. know, for your family. That's, and and th th it's a cycle, right? It, it, everything's cyclical. Hist history has, has cycles, right? So we're, we're in the phase right now where it's like hard times or what is it? Great times create weak people, right? Yeah. So now we're in weak people. If we're in agreements, we're very weak. Yeah, weak generation. people, weak people create hard times. Hard times create strong people. Strong people create great times. We're just in the season. Yeah. But this season's crazy, right? It's like super weak. Everybody's weak. Everybody's, you offend people, you get canceled, all this different type of stuff. And so we're just in a very weak cycle. And now more than ever, it should give people hope. It's like now more than ever, you have the opportunity to stand out, provide more value, to be an exceptional man or, or woman or human in general because most people are average. That's it. Like facts. It's yeah, just like it's, David Goggins says it off some awesome. I mean, he. I love David Goggins. I'm dude, huge David Goggins fans. I'm kind of. I'm kind of getting into like my own little crazy running regimen because uh, I've got ambitions to go run some ultras for yeah. a foundation I'm creating to raise money for wrongfully incarcerated people. That's good. Right. And so uh, there's nothing out there like it. And I've figured out that I'd love suffering. You know, I find so much resolve in suffering, mm. as everyone should do things uncomfortable every day of their life. Um, you know, he says it like this. He's like, it's very easy to be great now. And it should have never been that because everybody's mediocre. Mm -hmm. But then if you're great and you try to go do great with, with great people, then he says now become uncommon amongst the uncommon. Mm -hmm. Always have a pursuit mm -hmm. for excellence in anything you do. Even if you feel like you made it, mm -hmm. you have to show up every day. Yeah. And we'll, we'll wrap up here, but, you, I mean, I've heard you speak, right? I've seen you. I've seen you um, step on stages and just straight bring it home. I've seen you do it in many different ways too, right? So, like, when you get on stage, what is your what is your one or your main message that you try to convey? And I'm sure that's different depending on the room that you're in, right? But what is your what is your overall message when you're speaking in a transformative way? And st on stages in front of hundreds of thousands of people? It's a great question. The first thing that comes to me is most people win the money game, they lose the healing game. And so if you're open to what I'm saying, we're gonna win the healing game together. I'm gonna give you tools, I'm gonna give you strategies, I'm gonna give you exercises to allow you to look at parts of yourself that you don't wanna see so we can strip power away from them. Yeah. And understanding that, and I love people, right? So I understand it's like, not everybody, my mouth is gonna be moving, words will be coming out of my mouth, but not everybody will receive their blessing here today. And that's okay. Yeah. Whenever you wanna receive it, I'll be here, but I'm just gonna speak from the heart. I'm gonna take you through exercises. And if you play full out, life will never be the same for you. And so that's my main message. Um, because when people th like, oh, mindset, they don't really know what mind mindset's thrown around. All mindset, mindset, mindset. Mm -hmm. It's like, Everybody thinks they know mindset. Yeah. And so my intention is to disarm the crowd so they're open to receiving the information. And so that's my main message though, is like, listen, you can win the, the money game and you can win the business game, but if you lose the healing game, your whole bloodline suffers. Yeah. So let's deal with the healing game, right? And I think as, as men and women, we can only lead others as deep as we're willing to get led but also we can only heal others as deep as we're willing to heal ourselves. I can only take you as far as I'm willing to go. Right. But if I've never went to the, to the depths, I can't take you that far. Take and so going back to an offering, if I'm truly an offering and building myself into the greatest version every day, I got to do the healing every day. I got to do the deep work. And then because I do the deep work, I can now give you the map. Like this is the most beautiful thing. Like people are like, how did you build what you built? It's like, I healed myself and then turn around and give other people the map. And because I can save them time, they pay a lot of money for it, Yeah. right? And then, and then also too, to, to go 
just like to, to end off with the business stuff is one of the great, greatest pieces of advice that I can give people is commit to becoming a well of knowledge in like one, two or three things. You don't need to know a million things about, you don't need to know a million things about a million things. Just be like, like commit to be like, okay, I'm going to spend the rest of my life studying this, 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 and you're going to get to the point where you're going to, you're going to be such an expert and an authority at that topic or that niche that people are going to pay you a whole lot of money to help condense time for them. Mm -hmm. That's all I've done. Right. I'm 27 years old at 22. I committed my life to psychology, speaking and human behavior. Now people pay me a whole lot of money for psychology, communication and human behavior. Yeah. I'm one step away from stupid. I stay in my lane. I'm not over here trying to tell you the eighth wonder of the world is compound interest and this is how you're going to go into the market. Like, I'm not, I'm not over here trying to teach that. Yeah. Nick, what do you do? Psychology, human behavior, and communication. That's yep. it. Come the master of your lane. That's it. Stay in your yeah. lane. And by, and by the way, everything we do is opinionated. So just be your authentic self and that will be the filter that brings the right clients and the right people into your life and it repels the people that will never do business with you anyway. Oftentimes people are like, my market's saturated. It's like, shut up. <laughs> That's a belief, right? <laughs> right? The economy is just not good right now. And you wanna check my account? Uh, there's people out there that pay me a whole lot of money during all the seasons. Why? Because it's, it's, it's become valuable and get in front of the right people that already want what you have and give them value and they'll always pay for the information. And I know there are people on podcasts or I'll go on stages and there will be people that don't like me and there will be people that love me. I'm not trying to, my biggest mistake that I've made in my career is trying to create a message that everybody loves. Mm -hmm. And the moment that I just stopped caring about what people think and I was just gonna speak my heart and attract my tribe that way, life, life changed. That's good, bro. That's really That's good. good. You are your filter. You just show up your authentic self and if people don't like you, they weren't gonna do business with you anyway. Right. And guess what, the people that love you, they're gonna ride with you. They're gonna buy all your stuff, they're gonna invest in all your stuff, they wanna do business, they wanna learn from you, just being you. Yeah. Is there, any, is there any limitations that can be put on you, bro? I mean, in, in life, right? Like, you put up in a car, bro. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that to me, it's just, if there's a will, there's a way, right? Like, is it? At this point, when I look at you, I don't know there's a limitation that could be put on you. Is there any that you face in your life that, you know, look, people see Nick on Instagram, they see Nick on stages, they see Nick crushing it, right? But Nick probably still has some struggles and yeah. things that he has to overcome. Or is there even a limitation to be put on you, bro? Yeah, I would, I would say, I would say as a man, I just, I can't fight. I'd love to fight. I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to scrap. I guess that's why I did wrestling too. Yeah. Maybe in my, uh, my past life, I was a fighter. Cause like, I, bro, I'd be, a, I'd be a kid and like look up like street fights. I'd be like, this is so dope. You know, like look at them punching each other. Um, but I think that that could be a limitation. But if I catch you, what a no, but show up, right? <laughs> the right fight is the right time. You know? Dude, if you show up to the fight, you're a fighter. Yeah, right, it's you're as right. simple as that. You're right. don't have to hey, win. don't get any ideas. You see me on the street, I'm gonna have security with me, you know. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have these guys with me. But I agree. Yeah. If you show up to the fight, you gotta show you're, up. you're a fighter. Um so yeah, I don't think any any limit any limitations. You just I make this very simple for people. You are above all of your problems because your problems don't have a brain and you do. Mm. So you can always outthink your problems. Yeah, that's it. So simple. That's amazing. What the Say that again. You are above all of your problems because your problems don't have a brain and you do. So you can always outthink your problems. Your final message to, to our audience, right? Or who, who are tuning in here and to the, to the family, to the, to, the, to the mom and dad who are expecting and the doctor says, you might want to consider this. To the kid who is faced with with disabilities in his life right now that's feeling sorry for himself isn't in a good place in his life for for the person who's at a point in their life that is down out and may have both arms and both legs and is just making excuses to get back up what's your message to our audience who if you had to deliver one bring it home you need to get the fuck back up this is what you got to do If your family's not being bombed and your kids aren't in the street getting executed 
and you can go to the grocery store, you can buy whatever you want, and you have all your arms and all your legs, you're delusional. And the very problems that you think are problems are little insignificant things, and your ancestors in your bloodline didn't crawl through the Holocaust. They didn't go and go through the wars for you to bitch and complain about the small insignificant things that you think are problems. You live in a delusional world, and now that you know you're delusional, now you have the awareness to get out of your delusional world and start getting back to work. And every successful person has gone through an insane amount of trials and tribulations because that's because they understand that everything that life is going to put you through, it's going to allow you to become a greater version of yourself. People who aren't extraordinary probably haven't been through the trials and the tribulations. So give yourself permission to get messy, to make a mess, to take imperfect action, and... If your ancestors and bloodlines were looking down at you, would they, they be cheering you on? Or would it be throwing tomatoes at you? Because your movie sucks. How's that? Oh, oh God, God, bro. Dude, Mic drop. <laughs> Boom. What's up, everyone? Thank you so much for tuning in to the Get Back Podcast. If you like this episode, please like, comment, and subscribe, and follow on all platforms at the Get Back Podcast. We do enjoy sharing the greatest comeback stories, and thank you so much for tuning in. Get back, right? Get back right. Fell off. Lost my cool. Whoa, say. Bounce back. That dirt on my shoes. Fell back right. When you got real power, you can't lose. I just get back right. Yeah, get back right. Yeah, top down, head back. Ride by the high beats, don't fair facts. Money more than I don't wanna hear trap. I play Rick James when I'm in traffic. I've been doing this since fifth grade. Doing this since I've been safe. I've been rock crowds on a big stage. I've been made hits with some big names. Yada, 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 yada. Bought a Mercedes for my baby mama. VIP, rockin' don't take a I went to the Grammys and I took my mama. Bottles on bottles on bottles and models on models on models and dollars on dollars. Yeah, that don't help me when my soul wanna holla and I'm feeling the pain and I'm dealing with drummer. Woo! That's too deep. Yeah, guess I better fall back. Nah, get this work. You should've wore a hard hat. They told us don't work in the summer. I told them I'm working on something.